Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for inviting me. This I'm is Maria. Yeah. Hello. Do you know Maria? This is Maria. You started Hellebore. I'm sorry, but I can't see anyone's faces. <laughs> I can just see like a big blob of darkness. Um, thank you for paying attention to my little videos. It's been really emotional to see them on the big screen for the first time. Well, we started at the beginning and we've come up to date. Um, and yeah, what, watching all of that, it's a very rich uh, series of things, a lot of ground covers, like I said, right at the beginning. But wh when you started with that first issue, did you know it was going to be even the first issue of many? Did you, what did you have planned? Not at all. Um, I started um, because I felt that I needed to do something that was um, more mine, more, more like a personal project. So I had no idea. And I called my close friends and said, do you, do you want to write? for us, like, you know, I've got this idea for a little scene, and they were amazing people, and they said yes. <laughs> so we ended up with, um, I think it was seven pieces, the first issue, and it was incredibly well received. People were really, really kind. And um, when the second issue came out, that was at the beginning of COVID, and I thought, this is it. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna be able to, you know, people aren't gonna be interested. But um, people were actually, and um, we just published the ninth issue, and I have plans for more. So people have been incredibly kind. And when when you did that first issue, you asked your friends, where did, where did the idea come from? Have you been a fan of, of of these kind of publications in the past? Did did it come about because you just had the idea you wanted to collect friends things together? Did it feel like the right time? What, what was the in, initial you know sort of impetus for everything? So I had written for 14 times, you know, 14 times, the legendary magazine is about, um, well, just UFOs that, and um, <laughs> not just UFOs, okay. UFOs, ghosts, UFOs, ghosts, ancient sites. stories in general. So I did, I did write a lot about like um, history and folklore and archeology. span And um, I just thought it would be really cool if I could create a magazine about the things that I like to write about. So, just these things, nothing else, no UFO, well, maybe UFOs sometimes. <laughs> okay. So, or Christ in a loaf of bread. Yeah, yeah, maybe. There's a lot of that, isn't there? There's a lot of that, like um, strange, strange, um, how do you call them? There's a name for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Say it again? Phenomena. Phenomena, yeah, they call it simulacra corner. I think they're called simulacra, actually, yeah. those ones. But, um, yeah, and, and I felt that I had met a lot of people online. I think this was before Stone Club mm -hmm. came out, but there were a lot of people online, um, either academics or writers who were all really into this sort of thing. Mm. And it felt like there was a community online, but this community wasn't... I don't think that people would be aware of this community unless they were online, yeah. if that makes sense. So I just thought, I, I need to gather them somehow because it felt the right thing to do. And so that's what I've been trying to do since we started with Hellebore. And another interesting thing, I think, is how strong visually uh, Hellebore is. Right from the very beginning, you obviously had a very clear you know, idea, uh, for the aesthetic of the whole thing and how you put that together. That's right. Um, we are incredibly lucky to have Nathaniel, who's our um, designer. He lives in Canada, by the way. So <laughs> it's a bit of a time different time zone really but he's amazing I briefed him and told him I'd like it to be um, a combination of things I'd like it to be reminiscent of old school zines from you know 70s and 60s and 80s that sort of thing I'd like it to feel a bit underground and I'd like it to um, reminisce of old Polish film posters yeah. <laughs> this is why it looks so surreal because it, it kind of it's inspired by this imagery but also from late 19th century and early 20th century um, design so we've got all these well and counterculture as well obviously so we've got a little bit of of all of this together and Nathaniel is amazing because um, I always brief him at the beginning of each, each issue and tell him this is what we should be looking at and then he comes up with the most incredible things so we're really blessed to have him and and the choice of people it, it might have started with friends but again it felt like you had a it felt like you had a clear idea at least of who to ask but also a depth of subject that was very interesting 
Yes, um, I always try to, I always brainstorm each issue from the beginning and think this is what I'd like to have and actually look for people who have written about these things. And I don't want it to be just about history or archaeology, I want it to be about um, pop culture, I want it to be about folklore and about many other things that I'm interested in. And a subject within there's, there's place and um, when we're thinking about well, when we invited you to, to come and join us tonight, we we're thinking about place because, well, first of all, when we when we decided to do Stone Club here in London, we were like, well, you know, there's London Stone, there's a few interesting things if you move a bit further out, but it's, you know, it's an incredibly built up area. You know, it, it's a very odd place in some ways to choose to do something, although central and easy for people to get to. But um, it's interesting how place creates its own atmosphere over time. And it's interesting how people congregate to different places like Stonehenge, Glastonbury, or, or wherever it may be. And, and that was one thing that seemed interesting in the Southwest. That it seems like there's a really, well, an incredibly long lineage of people doing things in, in the Southwest, but also the fact that publishing's cropping up there and people are doing things from that area too. Yes, because you guys are based in Cornwall as mm -hmm. well. And we always talk about this that we are both based in the Southwest. What is it for you? Well, why, why the I mean, it's, it, 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 for me personally, it started more um, in Dorset and and those stones, and and and, and it, in terms of where I was looking at the time, it was the modern antiquarian. It was that website in about two thousand and three, two thousand and four, and it was a way of getting to know a county I didn't really know. And the online community was really strong. So you know, modern antiquarian, megalithic portal, so stone pages. Uh, probably before that even, but online communities that would share incredible information and help each other find places. It was all about community rather than what was better than something else, you know, or it was, you know, it was really geeky things like uh, this one space for a car down this lane and um, the best day to go there is this day and if you meet the farmer he's called Ken and um, he's really nice but only if you like cows, you know, or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> You know, so you had to, you know, and there'd be things like, uh, yeah, you can't get into this place unless you get the key, and you can only get the key from this guy, and this is his phone number. So, you know, there'd be like someone's private phone number on, you know, on the field notes of a website, so, uh, you know, with the details for it. Please phone in advance, be respectful, blah, blah, blah. Also, avoid bulls, <laughs> especially young ones, bullocks. Uh, you know, if you get there at the wrong time of year, fucking hell. It's <laughs> awful. Bulls in Constantine in Cornwall are not to be fucked with. <laughs> They're incredibly dangerous beasts. We tried to look for, I think it was the devils or something. Or other. That's not really helpful. <laughs> finger, pro the finger probably. Okay. I don't know. It was um, Dolman, someone in Wiltshire. And we actually had to run back yeah. because yeah, they were the bull signs. <laughs> We, actually, Lally and I had a terrifying experience in that day in Constantine where um, there was no signs to warn you to keep out and there was a fugu at the other end of the field and it wasn't too far, it was like 200, 200 feet, something like that, but fucking hell, it was really, really dangerous. I ended up for like two hours in a fugu, <laughs> which I, you know, I, I, I chose to decide that was what I wanted to do, to you know, fully immerse myself in the moment of, of it, but it was actually the terrifying thunder of these hooves <laughs> coming towards me. Every time I poked my head out, they'd run towards me, and the mums would sort of, sort of do like buckaroo. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely more scared of bulls than of the devil. Mm. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. Mithraian cults. Uh, um, but yeah, so yeah, lots of things cropping up, lots of great zines as well, historically from, from the southwest as well, a really interesting community of people. And lo lots of great protection of sites too. I have one question for you. Do you remember your first visit to a megalith? Mm, well, when I was thinking about that, it wasn't really a megalith. I grew up in a town called Sambach in Cheshire, and there's these things called the Saxon Crosses, or the Ancient Crosses, or the Sambach Crosses. Um, and I remember seeing them and thinking they were you know, they became very commonplace, but when I was really young, I thought they were really incredible. They've they got like Celtic, almost Pictish carvings, but they're Saxon. Um, a strange time of Christianity sort of invading the islands and also a rejection of it, and sort of strange 9th century tomb covers and things, you know, repurposed stone. 
that were then destroyed and rebuilt. But actually it was Dawson, it was the Nine Stones at Winterbourne Abyss, which was the site that really captured me. And it's an odd site in a way because the road runs right by it. But there used to be this very beautiful tree that kind of enclosed the space. And the, the tree got cut down because it wasn't safe or something, you know, like a health and safety thing. And it felt very exposed. Um, but there was something about that site that was still really magical, even though, um, even though it was this constant traffic thing going on. But, but what about you? What was your? What was the first site that captured you? So I grew up in Spain, so and Malaga actually. That's where I'm from. And the first one that I saw was on a school trip, and it's called uh, the Dolmen of Menga in Andequera, which is one of the oldest. In, in, in Europe, I think. So it was really impressive. I remember going in, you could go in at the time. I don't think you can now. So that was the first one for me ever. But the first one in, in England was Avebury. Mm. And um, I was really lucky because I, I, well, shortly after I came here, I studied my MA. Mm. And some of you know that um, Ronald Hutton was one of the, the legendary Ronald Hutton, AKA the Hut. <laughs> Anyway, I love him, he's amazing. I'm sure all of you do as well. But um, he took us on many um, on many trips. Um, although actually he wasn't in the Avery one. But anyway, we went to Avery with my, my group and that was really impressive because of the layout of, of Avery. Um, I hadn't seen Children of the Stones at the time and I didn't really have that experience of being within a stone circle of that massive diameter of that, you know, I hadn't been to Stonehenge either, so it was really impressive for me. And they, did he lead that? Did he go with you? No, not to this, not to that one. He took us to Glastonbury. Mm. Um, that was amazing. That was a really good. I mean, he did the whole tour of the. Have you been to the Chaliswell Garden? So um, he did the whole tour, and he did the whole ritual of drinking, you know, the waters, and then pass the cup to share it with us. And I remember when we were on top of Glastonbury Tour and we were looking around and he had been talking about the Zodiac, the Glastonbury Zodiac. And uh, he was talking about Frederick Blybond as well, which is this archeologist um, who excavated Glastonbury Abbey in the beginning of the 20th century. And um, Blybond actually is remembered now because of his strange story, because he used automatic writing to try and communicate with the spirits of the dead monks. Um, from Glastonbury Abbey and he claims, sort of, that they revealed the layout of several chapels and um, that's, well he said that that's the reason why he had found those chapels really easily. Anyway, it was Hutton, Ronald Hutton who told me this story or told us that story right there and I just wrote it down in my head and then I ended up doing my project um, on Frederick Blybond um, at the end of my MA. And that was the thing that set everything in motion, I think, and um, brought me here. Oh, that's amazing. So Glastonbury is featuring today. The, uh, was it Gates, Gates of Wisdom, Bly Bonds? Um, Gates of Remembrance. Gates of Remembrance. Um, it's still very present in Glastonbury. You know, you see those books occasionally for sale as well, but the... Um, There's a reprint as well. There's, yeah. yeah. I, I think the first time I went there, um, I don't know, maybe it wasn't the first time, but about 20 years ago when I was there, I walked into the church, you know, they had this um, labyrinth in the car, you know, this like moan into the lawn in the church in the high street. And I was really interested in Bly Bond at the time. So I went in and I talked to the vicar and they were like, oh, you know, it was like, they kind of thought it was really cool, but they were also like, I technically can't talk yes. to you about this because he used automatic techniques to channel yeah. dead monks. <laughs> if, if anyone is curious, um, I, after this actually, because this, this MA that I did was uh, Archaeology for Screen Media and it was sort of co-organised by the people from Time Team. And so I ended up working for the producer of Time Team, um, doing research for a different project. And it's because I was working on Bly Bond and he was working on Bly Bond as well and so he hired me on the spot. Which was like a remarkable um, strike of luck. Because I ended up, yeah, working for him, and and so there's a program. I think it's called The Unexplained. That was, you know, a long time ago with Tony Robinson. Um, I don't know. Beck remembers it. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, it came out a few years ago, and it was on on all the automatic writing. They tried to prove or disprove the whole thing, and um, yeah, it was really interesting to work on it. I don't think you've seen that, but you know. Yeah, it wasn't very successful, I have to say. <laughs> no, no. So I mean, so we actually made a Time Team episode. Our film of the month. We, we we sort of choose books and films and records every month, and uh, we're really interested. Which one? In, well, we chose the Boli Fugu one. Because it's great for so many reasons. It's great because they do eventually, spoiler alert, find an Iron Age village uh, within the garden, but only after they've um, found a sewage pipe, uh, a, 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 a disused water pipe, and, and, and nothing for the first couple of days. It's, but it's great because they're so optimistic, and they, you know, they just go to the pub and get wrecked, and they're like, oh, "I'll be fine." You know, it's like I'm sure there's something here. You know, there's a fugu, so there's got to be something else. Uh, so it, it sort of works out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it depends. I mean, it's a surprise, isn't it? It's like opening a present, yeah. or the, like the, the chocolate box from um, that movie with Tom Hanks. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Also, if you do get to see Ronald Hutton, if you get the chance, I would recommend it. We, we booked him to, to do a thing in Brighton with us last year, and I've never heard so many wolf whistles as when he took his waistcoat off. <laughs> it was a magical moment. 350 people lost their shit because Ronald Hutton took his waistcoat off. It was really exciting. Yeah, I mean, he's a legend. I, I sometimes bump into him when I'm doing my shopping because we both live in Bristol. It's just brilliant. Um, so all of that, all of those things that that you were talking about, and Ronald being very open to fly bombs and open to dead monks channeling ancient chapels and things—they're they're not traditionally history. No, but I think um, it was an event that certainly happened because fly bond actually wrote the book, and it's very interesting to study it within a context, within a cultural context. That was, um, you know, the amount of um, well, the belief in spirituality that people mm. had at the time. Mm. Um, I think I I don't buy the the idea that he actually spoke to the dead monks. I don't, you know, I don't think there's any proof there to prove that. I mean, I'm open-minded generally, but I'm also, mm. you know. Well, it interests me though because of the sort of you know that that cyclical interest or or disinterest or. Um, occlusion or inclusion of, of these ideas within the world, you know, within academic fields of study like Ronald Hutton, you know, including those things and at least as something that's explored. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, you know, there's clearly something going on now where there's a, a resurgence of interest or, or if not a resurgence of bringing to the, to the surface maybe a little bit more again. Yes, and I think I have to say, well, I mean, I spend most of my day behind my desk. Well, I don't have a desk, but you know, a table. <laughs> Um, so I, I, you know, this kind of thing is completely alien to me. Like, you know, coming to London and then some, you guys look quite hip. I'm pretty impressed, um, <laughs> honestly. And um, but I, I just think that Lali and Matthew have done, have done really well. I mean, they're organising all these events, and you can definitely feel that there's something happening. Mm. I mean, I could feel that happening online, but I think you guys are doing it in real life, which feels amazing. And I'm not surprised that people are connecting with that well yeah i mean yes and uh, but the cycles have are, i made you blush no yeah <laughs> but the cycles are really uh, I, I could, you know I, I don't think it's ever gone away particularly but it definitely in in the early 2000s late 90s early 2000s i remember there being a really interesting time when there was a lot of sharing of all of that going on it was based on the technology of the time so it was like message boards and early facebook probably even myspace or something you know and then maybe it's something that changes with technology you know i'm interested in that how technology and very ancient things work in combination with each other you know andy who does the megalithic portal you know the, the ability to be able to code the site and create something that can allow people to, to yeah that's an amazing resource as well that's it, incredibly absolutely. useful absolutely and but, but then on top of that, maybe it is a, a sort of social media thing or something. But I don't think it is that. I don't think it is actually really genuinely that. I think that helps to spread news about things that happen. It helps people yeah. to connect. But but there's something. There must be something deeper. There must be something that's driving the interest and driving the um, 
the desire to, to find out and connect around some of these subjects that's not a surface of social media. What is your theory? Why do you think this is happening now? Well, I think there's a lot of world events that have made people question a lot of, a lot of things without getting too political. Um, and I think there's a need and a, um, there's a purpose in redefining what it means to be alive at this moment in time what nationality means, what what being a human being means in relation to other people around in the world means, regardless of where you're from, it's, it's very troubled. So sometimes looking backwards to inform the future is, is probably very helpful in that regard. Yeah, I think partly it feels like, well, I, I, I do think that we're going through a period of crisis, that it's not just political crisis, it's also spiritual. Mm. And I do think that lots of people find meaning in, in you know, sharing that communal experience in, in these incredible sites. Um, so I definitely think that we don't really have an easy way to be in contact with, with the, the, the awe that religion produce, well, provokes in some, among some people. Well, certainly, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic country and I went to a convent school and that's my background but um and i i do remember actually that feeling of awe when i was in church when i was little but um i i think that that feels really alien to many of us now and i think that this is a way of mm. recovering it yeah. somehow and then of course um environmental crisis as well really important as well and the fact that many of us don't if we live in a city how how frequent it is that we go to the countryside and are in the countryside and that's actually really good for us isn't it it's like you know for your well-being yeah completely you know any of those sort of nature connection ideas around health well-being time you know time spent if, if it's accessible and and yeah that, I, yeah i agree with you actually i think um i think another thing we think about a lot around that is that it's pre-political systems and pre-enclosure acts and pre-national identities as we understand them today so kind of means you don't have to deal necessarily with all of that you can deal with it through it but um, the kind of irrelevancies you know the, uh, uh, and, it, and it's it can be a helpful way of thinking about movement of people it can be a helpful way of thinking about um, nationality it can be a helpful way of thinking about migration uh, and movement and constant movement did you see that exhibition in um, the British Museum the Stonehenge one mm, yeah because that was amazing I think they did a really good job in presenting the way that the world would have been at the time because it's not often well we don't really think about these things very often but then when we do i don't think that you get you get the big picture of, mm. of how these people were and the fact that they move yeah and the archaeology always around you know the bodies are found you know and then it's well, this person came from Switzerland, this person came from what we recognise as now Germany or Belgium or the Netherlands. And, um, you know, we're talking about four, six thousand, twelve thousand with Creswellian culture, you know, movement of people. Which I think is a really helpful thing when you're thinking about how best to accept or, or, or to respond to, you know, current crises. I think it's a helpful thing. That's right. I agree. And, um, so what, you know, an incredible amount of things already published. Uh, <laughs> incredible, it's quite generous, really. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's a yeah. lot. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And, and, and now book publishing, not just zines, you know, not, I said just, but not just smaller publications, but book publishing. We, we did the travel guide, Occult Britain, partly because this was at the beginning of lockdown, and I thought, no, I have to do something. I'm gonna go crazy otherwise. And um, speaking to Verity, one of our contributors, she said, it's amazing that we, you know, we have done this when we can't go to places. Yeah. Yeah, it's a virtual way that. of accessing and yes. researching and interpreting. And then I keep thinking, I need to think about the next book, because I do have some ideas, but there's no time. Because <laughs> <laughs> I keep planning things, but hopefully there will be another book soon. Mm. Well, not soon. Right. Soonish, relative. Yeah. You know, we're talking. We're, we've got four thousand no spans here. It's fine. Um, and cards. 
Yes, the card game. The card game again. <laughs> I feel I feel really selfish talk, talking about all these things because it's kind of like yeah, you know, my whims basically. It's like oh yeah, I fancy doing a card game. <laughs> I just drag everyone. But um, the card game was something that I wanted to do because I had it. You know, I thought it would be fun. My my son who is six and a half. And I had been um, making lots of um, fake top trumps with his favorite things. So a lot of Godzilla, a lot of um, dinosaurs, that sort of thing. And obviously the next consequence was, um, why don't I do like a hell of a top trumps? <laughs> so that's what happened. And Ronald Hunt made it. Well, yes, because I thought, I I've, I've got to have Ronald Hutton in this collection. So I did it message him and, and he found it really amusing, bless him. He messaged me back saying, yeah, of course, I'd be delighted. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll send you the card when it's this sign, when the text is there, so that you can just, you know, if you don't like it, you... And, and I did send it to him, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that looks like me. <laughs> did, did he try and dispute, like, how strong he was as a card? No, he was really, yeah, he was really leveled. <laughs> I like, like, I want to be the best I actually one. gave him a lot. Of, yeah, he's one of the top trumps to be honest. I think he can beat people like um, Crowley, for example. Ooh. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd be happy if I was Ronald. That's, that's pretty good. And I think it's everyone's favourite top trump car. Yeah, yeah. It seems to do very well. The, the funny thing, you know, is that the University of Bristol somehow found out about it. And because um, it's going to be his 70th, 70th birthday at the end of this year, they were putting together this tribute. And in the blurb, they said, and he's also a top trump card, <laughs> which is, you know, really amazing. I sort of hope that, you know, if he does spend any time on social media, he changes his, his bio to say, you know, top trump cars. He don't, he's an, I don't think, yeah, he's a very busy man. <laughs> I don't think he spends time in social media. No. Too much but to I, I did gift him the, the, the card game as well, so hopefully he's played. Mm. And, and to bring it up to date as well, the latest issue, you know, it, it, they all have been, but this one is, is, is surely the most stone club of all issues. I now. thought of you when, when, when I published it, because I thought this, hopefully the guys from Stone Club will be into it. <laughs> so, you know, and also I have to say, um, the cover, the oh, amazing yeah. artist, Claire, I found out about her work through you guys, so thank you. Um, I think she's, she, she, yeah, her photographs are really incredible, really otherworldly. And um, we did try to play with a double exposure on the cover, but because we have the grainy effect, yeah. you know, so that it looks a bit more kind of DIY, if that makes sense, it didn't work very well. So we ended up using something that didn't have this double exposure. But uh, yeah, everyone has had really good um, words about the cover for this issue. So thank you for introducing me to her. Well, we, show, we showed some of Claire's work here, I can't remember which one it was, but Claire also was the um, filmmaker that made Trezor, Gweno's film that we showed here I one didn't time. Know. Yeah, so she filmed Trezor, she, she's yeah, a great filmmaker as well as photographer, so... I knew she had photographed the yeah. cover, but I didn't know them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's coming up next where, where you know what's to look forward to do you have a do you have a plan for what's so next? i can reveal the theme for the next issue is um the darkness issue because i open for submissions so there's a lot of you know, it's going to be very dark obviously <laughs> sorry that joke. anyway um, we have a lot a lot of interesting pieces i've had very good submissions um unfortunately we can't publish all of them but um, yeah, that's to come out in October, and there will be another surprise this year, which I can't reveal. But I'll keep people watching though, and it's yeah. that's, that's good. And 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 this is this is the website we've got up on the screen, that's and right. you're around in all the usual places. Yeah, um, Hellebozine on Instagram and Twitter, and yeah, if anyone needs me, there's like a good, yeah right, um, yeah email me section. Yeah, and if you, if you want to write about darkness. Actually, no, the deadline was yesterday. <laughs> Sorry. You're going to have to wait. Um, but Maria, thank you so much for joining thank us Thank you so tonight. much for having me. Thank guys. you. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you for your support. Thank you.
We're going to put some music on and we're going to take a short break and then we shall be back with Elizabeth Garner. Yeah.